live long and prosper. So in this video series, I'm going to be talking through the social justice elements of every episode of the original series of Star Trek. Um, the thing that inspired this project was actually a Fox News article which argued that Star Trek has in some way betrayed its traditional commitment to sort of political neutrality or middle ground by embracing progressive politics. In this series, we're going to see that Star Trek has always embraced progressive politics and it's always been aspirational for social justice in various senses. Um, I am taking a broad perspective on social justice here, um, so that may, that may include multiple different types of uh, social justice, whether that's racial, whether that's economic, whether that's religious, whether that's abilities, gender and sexuality, um, anything, anything broadly considered. Um, I will go through every episode. Some of the episodes I will, I will interview fellow Trekkies and talk with them about it. Um, and then below, uh, in the descriptions, I will give you additional information about the episodes, particularly uh, their original air date, who wrote the the, uh, the screenplay, and who uh, directed that episode. I also want to dedicate this series to my dad, Michael Allen Zapkin. Uh, he was an OG Trekkie from back in the day, and uh, it was watching the original series with him that I came to love Star Trek. In this video, we're going to talk about the episode, The Galileo 7. This is another one without real strong social justice themes, necessarily. It's, uh, it's just a good sci-fi story. Um, so basically... The Enterprise is on a mission to deliver some vital medicines, but they see a quasar phenomenon. Ooh. And they have, they have standing orders to investigate these sorts of things. So Kirk takes the time that, uh, the, the time that they have before they would need to leave in order to get to where they're delivering this medicine to investigate the Quasar. That involves sending out Spock, McCoy, Scotty, and then four other random crew people um, on, on a shuttlecraft. The shuttlecraft, uh, their instruments are basically be become non-functional. Their sensors and communications become non-functional because of the ionization from this Quasar. And they get pulled in to the one inhabitable planet in the whole area where they crash land, um, the ship, has, the, the shuttlecraft has lost most of its fuel. Um, it's badly damaged. Scotty is fixing it. Um, meanwhile, on the Enterprise, their instruments are malfunctioning. Sensors don't work. Um, communications are down. They do know that the shuttlecraft got pulled off course, but they don't know where to. Um, and they now have two days to find the shuttlecraft, basically by looking physically, like going out and just actually checking stuff, because their sensors don't work. On the planet, Spock is in command of this cra crashed shuttle, uh, crash crashed shuttle. Um, McCoy delights several times in saying, hey, it's your first command. How are you enjoying it? Spock is attempting to logically reason his way through this situation, which becomes much more difficult when they're attacked and one of the shuttle crew members is killed by these sort of very large ape-like, maybe Sasquatch caveman type creatures um these indigenous creatures then sort of start attacking the rest of the crew spock is opposed to killing them even though the rest of the crew wants to kill them 
Um, Spock believes that if they can just scare them off, then uh, these creatures will leave them alone for long enough to fix the shuttle, etc., etc. What kind of ends up happening is one of the one of the fuel lines breaks, and so the rest of the shuttle's fuel is um, is lost, and so Scotty has to. My boy Scotty has to drain the phasers, which are the only thing protecting them from the indigenous inhabitants. Um, he has to drain the phasers into the engine to get them enough energy, enough fuel to lift off and get into orbit and possibly to re-enter the atmosphere and maybe be able to land. As this is happening... Uh, they're trying to figure out what they can leave behind because they need to lose at least 500 pounds from the shuttlecraft in order to reach escape velocity. The problem is that there's very little equipment on the shuttlecraft that they don't actually need. Personally, I would have said ditch the chairs because they, they leave the chairs in there, but they don't do that. Um, however, as crew members start getting killed off by these indigenous inhabitants, that helps them shed some of the weight. Anyway, um, on the Enterprise, you have High Commissioner Ferris, who is really just kind of a dick the whole time, and he's basically like, Kirk, we gotta get going. We gotta get this medicine to the planet. And Kirk is like, I am not leaving until the last possible second. Um... So that's all going on. Finally, that last possible second hits. Um, the Enterprise has to leave to go take this medicine. And it's pretty much at that moment where they are flying away with their scanners turned back toward the quasar at maximum velocity that the shuttle manages to take off and get into orbit. The problem is the Enterprise is now too far away, so they can't actually see the shuttle on their scanners. So, what Spock does is he dumps the rest of the fuel and ignites it, basically just burning streak of fuel across the surface of the, the atmosphere, and the Enterprise sees that, comes back, and beams them aboard. So, as I said, there's not that much here in terms of social justice themes necessarily, but I think there's a couple. So one is the question of leadership and how do you lead? Another is a question of sacrifices, sacrificing for the good of the many. And then I think another potentially is a kind of anthropological one in terms of making contact and meeting other civilizations. Uh, so this one I think is the least interesting one because there isn't really much engagement with the indigenous population of this planet, uh, which I think is called Tarsus II. But I don't... I'm, I may be slightly wrong about that. Um, but this, this planet, again, has these big sort of ape-like creatures... Uh, caveman type creatures, Sasquatch, whatever it is. Um, there's no real direct contact with them. There's just some fighting. And this, of course, is one of the big things. Like, if we look back historically at particularly the way that colonial powers, but explorers in general, encounter new cultures, this is often a very fraught moment. Um, when Europeans encountered Native Americans in the Caribbean, in South America, North America, uh, when Europeans encountered Aboriginal Australians or the Maori in New Zealand, Polynesians in Hawaii and Samoa and places like this. Um, these are very, very delicate situations in which violence is always potentially at the forefront. And the fact that so many of the crew of this shuttlecraft are in favor of just 
let's kill them is really sort of revelatory of that. It's, it, yes, there's a self-defense element of it because the indigenous population does attack them and there's no real sort of attempt to communicate. But still, that idea of let's just kill them is, is hugely problematic in several ways. So we've got that. Um, I think the, the question of leadership is really the central theme of this episode because Spock is put in command and he, of the, of this shuttlecraft. Um, and his approach is based on logic. This is, of course, Spock. And so he recognizes certain realities that many of the other people on the crew seem unwilling to recognize. To his credit, Scotty seems pretty on board with this is the reality of how fucked we are. And here's what we're likely going to have to do. Because Spock's initial suggestion to get rid of the, the 500 pounds would be to leave three crew members out of seven behind on this planet. This is actually really the thing that sets most of the crew against him. Um, even though, in reality, there's very little way around that. And Spock does make the argument, it's better to sacrifice one person than six. And, I mean, he makes that argument when, when a couple of the other crew people have died. But Spock seems quite willing to take that, take that principle of sacrifices have to be made for the greater good to its logical conclusion because at the end when the shuttle is about to take off they get attacked again by uh, the indigenous creatures of this planet McCoy and um, I can't remember the other guy's name there's another crew member who's just in this episode and never appears again they're both running back toward the, the shuttle. Spock attempts to hold off the uh, indigenous population by throwing back one of their giant spears. Then he gets basically hit with a giant rock, like a big boulder comes and like traps his leg. And the other McCoy and the other guy come back and rescue him, even though Spock is saying, no, go leave me here, take off without me. Because Spock recognizes that without his body weight, the entire crew, surviving crew at least, is much more likely to make orbit and to actually be successful at escaping this planet. And so he's willing to make that sacrifice for the greater good. On the other hand, McCoy and the other crew member are not willing to make that sacrifice. And so that's a, it's an interesting element in terms of both this question of leadership and in terms of what what sacrifices need to be made for mutual for, for the survival of the maximum number of people possible. Um, the other component, I guess, of this, the other problem with Spock's logic or his logical approach in this episode is that it is very much goal-oriented. And the other people on the shuttle, again, with the exception of Scotty, who, who seems to be the only one who really gets what's going on here, um, the other characters seem more focused on... I don't know, maybe metaphysics or I mean, they would call it humanity, and that's not entirely an inaccurate thing. Like, they insist on burying the dead, and they they argue that S Spock should come out to the funeral of the first guy who dies and say some appropriate words because he is the captain of this shuttlecraft. 
And Spock is like, look, I'm trying to fix this shuttlecraft so we can get out of here. I can go do this pointless thing from a logical perspective, this pointless thing, which is going to disrupt the work that I'm doing. Or I can stay here, do this work, and probably the rest of us will be saved. And so the fact that Spock more or less dismisses the ritual associated with death really upsets a lot of the other crew members. And it's hard to tell whether, it's hard to tell who's right here. I think this is one of the great things about so many Star Trek episodes is that you do have, it's like Greek tragedy in a way. You have agonistic conflict. That is, two different perspectives, each of which has its own virtues and each of which is potentially legitimate. But they're they're in conflict with one another. So, does it have some value to die like men, to have burial, to have... Um, words said over one's grave, etc., etc., or is it more important to unemotionally focus on the task of survival? It's a... I don't, I don't think the episode comes down one way or the other. Um, I think it does... I think ultimately it attempts to show us that Logic is not sufficient in and of itself, but emotion is not sufficient in and of itself. You need a combination of both. And actually, that's, at the end of the episode, that's what McCoy and Kirk accuse Spock of having done. Um, when, when he vents the fuel and ignites it, Kirk reads this, I think at McCoy's prompting, as his line is, you reasoned it was time for an emotional outburst. And I actually don't know if I think that's even right. I mean, Kirk's premise is it was a desperate act and desperation is an emotion. Spock basically says, logically, there was no alternative. And there wasn't. Like, they were all going to die. There was not enough fuel to re-enter the atmosphere and, and uh, land safely. They were going to burn up on re-entry. Spock knew that by that point the Enterprise would have left. The only realistic hope was if they could create a large enough signal that the Enterprise's sensors would pick it up from wherever they were. It was a logical move, even if it was a move made out of desperation in the sense that there was no alternative. So I think that I don't know. I think it I think it it there's a reasonable case to be made that it was a purely logical decision, and I think Spock would make that argument. McCoy and Kirk, I think, would say. This was an emotional decision, even if there is logic that supports it. And maybe that's sort of the ultimate message of the episode in terms of how to be a good leader. Both emotion and logic need to be tempered by the other. 